but we begin with one of the stranger Hail Marys we've ever seen as the pressure builds in the Mueller probe. Trump lawyer Michael Cohen is publicly locking arms with, get this, one of Donald Trump's celebrity enemies. This move comes amidst a new ruling tonight in the Fed's scorched earth effort to gather every last document, text, and audio recording from Cohen's offices. This is a strange and pivotal time for Michael Cohen. What he does could literally impact the entire Trump presidency. So we are going to turn first live tonight to the lawyer who's tangled with Cohen from the start and who predicted part of his demise. Michael Avenatti is my live guest tonight, and I have some big questions for Michael. Now that is in a moment. Here is the context. Tom Arnold is a Trump critic who's now spending part of his career trying to either catch or torment Donald Trump. He has a new project launch to get damaging tapes on Trump and Cohen deciding to share this provocative photo. Don't worry. Tom Arnold is on it. And I'm Tom Arnold. Arnold saying tonight that Cohen did talk to him for his new show, Hunting Trump, and he adds, quote, this dude has all the tapes, this dude has everything, and it's on. I hope Trump sees the picture of me and Michael Cohen, and it haunts his dreams. Now, moments ago, my colleague Nicole Wallace asked Arnold if Cohen had given him any tapes. We know that, the, that what was seized from his offices included a lot of audio and, and uh, recordings. Did he promise to share those with you? To share with me? Uh, I, oh, oh. Uh, Michael Cohen, first of all, does not work for Vice. I want to make that clear. He's not getting any money. He's probably broke. I mean, I, I shouldn't even say that. <laughs> Michael Cohen uh, did not make any promises with me. But you're working on it. You're trying to get Oh, it. I love it. They're working on it. Now, the pressure is building on Cohen, which goes to why he may be engaging in any of this. New reporting that the National Enquirer tabloid would actually send Cohen stories about Trump in advance of publication. That's something no news outlet is supposed to do. This was during the height of the 2016 campaign and then would change them on Cohen's request. This includes stories that would hammer Clinton, like getting stories about her health before they were published. The Inquirer denies this. Meanwhile, the feds are subpoenaing the Inquirer's publisher for the case. Now, Michael Avenatti, Stormy Daniels' lawyer, joins me. Michael, what do you make of what Cohen is doing? Well, Ari, you know, I think it was uh, first on your show that I predicted uh, in early April that eventually Michael Cohen would uh, flip on the president, and the president had entrusted Mr. Cohen with secrets that he should have never entrusted him uh, with. I think I was the first one to make that prediction. I did it in early April, and I'm going to hold to it. But look, I want to caution people uh, about jumping to conclusions about what Tom Arnold has or does not have. I think that you know, a lot of these cryptic communications, people are assuming quite a lot. Um, and I think that perhaps Michael Cohen allowed that picture to be taken to send a message to the president um, that the president potentially is in a lot of trouble here. From my understanding, uh, Michael Cohen is very concerned about being put on an island and abandoned by this president and the White House as it relates to having some of his legal fees paid. Uh, et cetera, and I think that perhaps this is part of the messaging. That messaging, though, ultimately means what? I mean, isn't it a bigger threat for him to do something with the feds than with, with all due respect, Tom Arnold? Without a doubt, but I mean, I think that, you know, perhaps this is a, a flare gun shot in the air for Michael Cohen uh, to, you know, a, a message to Mr. Trump or others um, that there may be things coming down the pike. But look, Ari, I'm going to stand by what I've been saying now for months. There is no doubt in my mind that Michael Cohen is going to be indicted and face some very, very serious charges. There's no doubt in my mind that he's going to try to trade or flip on this um, president. And, you know, I've told you before that there were audio tapes and a whole lot of information that was seized in connection with these raids, among other problems that Michael Cohen and the president have, um, is that it appears that Michael Cohen basically was one of the world's great hoarders as it related to uh, keeping evidence and cell phones and the like. I mean, this guy never threw anything away, which I'm sure the government's ecstatic about right now. I, and you feel uh, what you're calling this uh, pension for hoarding 
uh, could come back to haunt him because the feds, and, and by the way, we have one of these rulings, it's here on my desk, today in the Kimball Wood case, which you've been in and out of uh, at times, uh, this ruling basically says the vast majority of everything that he, to use your verb, hoarded, uh, will be in the Fed's hands. I mean, does that mean to some degree he's less of a key witness because all he would do is corroborate what they're already going to have? Well, a couple things. I mean, I read that ruling and I've looked at the mountain of evidence that was seized in connection with these raids. And, and you're right. I mean, 99 point, you know, probably 5% of this uh, information is not going to be privileged. It's going to significantly tighten the noose on Michael Cohen, make it uh, very, very difficult, I think, Ari, for him to escape whatever charges he's ultimately uh, facing in connection uh, with that proceeding, and I think it's going to make it that much more likely that he's going to be forced to uh, to flip on the president in an effort to save himself and save his family. You know, none of this bodes well for the president. I've been saying that for a long time. I mean, this was the president's right-hand guy for the better part of 12 years um, that dealt with, you know, all of uh, all of the things that I guess nobody else wanted to deal with or, or none of the secrets that the president wanted to entrust to anyone else. He picked the wrong fixer, Ari, and I've said that for some time now. You have, and the National Enquirer stuff is so darn weird uh, that it's hard to see exactly how it fits. Lawyers love precedent, as you know, because it allows a lawyer to say, hey, something that was bad before, if a judge said it was bad, is, is definitely bad now. I don't know, and I'm curious your view, whether there's a lot of precedent for some of these allegations, which suggests that the National Enquirer, uh, which is a, not the most reputable entity, but claims to be a media entity, was in some sense an arm of Michael Cohen, Donald Trump, or worse for them, potentially legally, the Trump campaign, because as you know, there are very specific regulations on that. Let me read from this new reporting, which says that Trump would be very interested in the stories on Clinton's health. One cover story during the campaign purported to disclose her secret medical file. Another, that cover story, then sent to Cohen in advance. Uh, do you have a legal theory or any knowledge based on your uh, dealings uh, against Cohen about whether any of this stuff, which is certainly shady, uh, is also potentially uh, exposes criminal liability to Cohen or the Trump campaign? Well, I think it might, because here's what we don't know. We don't know the full extent of the flow of money, if there was any flow of money, between the Trump Organization, Michael Cohen, um, and the National Enquirer, or AMI. And if there was flow of money, that could prove to be very, very problematic for all of those parties. There could be potentially money laundering or bank fraud charges that might result from that. And, and let's remember, there can also be additional campaign finance violations associated with that conduct. If AMI, if AMI was purposely engaged in an organized effort with Michael Cohen and the Trump Organization to influence that campaign, and it was effectively being coordinated by Donald Trump or Michael Cohen, but none of that was reported, that could be very, very problematic. Well, and that goes to something, you know, there are people who look at your litigation and your public advocacy and they say, gosh, Michael Avenatti's everywhere. You're all over the place. You're familiar with that reputation, sir? Well, I mean, look, Ari, you know, I've, I've been handling some really big cases for the better part of 18 years. Some of them have gotten a fair amount of publicity. I mean, no, nothing has gotten as nothing much publicity. Nothing like this. Here's the no, flip no, side. Nothing. But, but here's the flip side, Michael. There's also the argument that Michael Cohen is Trump's fixer, who is your legal adversary uh, in the civil case, put himself everywhere. Because let me play for you some of the way Donald Trump dealt with Clinton's health, which we're now learning only from journalism and this other reporting, uh, is something that was apparently part of the bartering with the Inquirer organization. And then you add to that that Michael Cohen pops up in the Susan McDougal litigation. For folks who forget, that was another uh, individual, a former Playboy Playmate, who had dealings with Donald Trump, who felt she made a contract with the, a lawyer, Keith Davidson, who you replaced in the Stormy Daniels case. And ultimately, people say, what was Michael Cohen doing in the middle of a National Enquirer contract where he didn't have any legal standing or role, which raises, I think, the heat on him. Take a listen, then, with all of that in context in mind, to Donald Trump reading right out of the National Enquirer Cohen playbook to attack Clinton on her health. She also lacks the mental and physical stamina to take on ISIS. She took a little short circuit in the brain. Hillary Clinton failed every single time as Secretary of State. Now she wants to be president. Hillary Clinton doesn't have the fortitude. 
strength or stamina to lead in our world. Do you view this as a potential type of coordination where Michael Cohen um, was outside of what his authority or legal limits should be as a private sector counsel to Donald Trump as an individual, not as a candidate? Well, if he was carrying this out on behalf of uh, Donald Trump, you know, again, I think this could raise a whole host of issues relating to that campaign and what AMI's involvement was. But, you know, I do want to go back to something you just touched on, Ari. You know, my public advocacy and how much uh, media attention that I have received and, and as many shows as I've been on, I have to tell you, um, it's working. Uh, you know, just within the last week in connection with this other case that I'm working on, we received a number of whistleblowers that came forward and we're getting ready to blow the doors off this border situation. And had I not been out there and if I was not such a known uh, attorney, none of that would have come to fruition. Uh, you know, all of this is working to the benefit of my clients and I'm not going to stop because it's very, very effective. Well, stay with me, Michael. For more context, I, I want to add in Daniel Goldman, who was a former federal prosecutor in the same district, the Southern District of New York, where Cohen is currently facing these issues, had that ruling today. Liz Plank, a senior producer with Vox Media, who has covered some of the issues, including these NDAs and Donald Trump's dealings with women from the start. Uh, to you first, Daniel, uh, based on the new reports, uh, as well as the discussion Michael and I was having, does this just look like really scummy, underhanded, secret dealings with the inquirer, or do you see legal exposure? No, are you and I have spoken before about how the inquirer and the Stormy Daniels Daniel's case can all fit together with Karen McDougal and how the evidence of one deal may impact the other one and ultimately help to build a case of campaign finance violations. Now we're learning exactly what we were wondering before, which is that there was, appears to have been some coordination between Cohen on behalf of Trump and the Inquirer. So now you have two people who've been paid off, and if you add in the doorman for Donald Trump, who was also paid off by AMI, this seems to be much more of a coordinated effort. Then you, got, then you have to take the next step and figure out, okay, where's the money coming from, as Michael Avenatti just pointed out, and was this an in-kind contribution to the campaign? Was it on behalf of the campaign? Then you get into some of the legal complexities, but the coordination aspect of it that we're learning about tonight is very, very important to a potential case for campaign finance fraud. And on that briefly, Daniel, uh, walk us through what it means when we're learning that the feds are subpoenaing the National Enquirer. What are they seeking to get on that side? Well, uh, they're, they're certainly seeking to get the communications that AMI had with the Trump campaign, the Trump organization, Michael Cohen, in connection to this $150,000 deal that they had with Karen McDougal, uh, or that they paid out to Karen McDougal. And that seems to be increasingly an in-kind contribution to the campaign to keep her quiet, not some kind of a catch and kill or right. even a deal uh, to, to uh, promote her. So right. it's and I wonder really those whether, communications, yeah. And I wonder whether they can find also internal communications where they might be saying to Trump or his fixer, yeah, we'll, we'll do this, we owe you one. And then internally they say, look, uh, you know, guys, we're doing this to help the campaign or we're doing this for political purposes, the kind of internal stuff that could be incriminating. I'm not saying they have that, but that might be part of the investigative look. Yeah. I want to bring in Liz Plank, uh, who's reported these stories with us for a while. I mean, Liz, you know the old saying, ain't no party like a Michael Cohen party because the Michael Cohen party's really messy. Yeah. And, and I just wonder whether this is the kind of fixing that's so messy it's not fixing that much. Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, since we're talking about the bodyguard story in the Wall Street Journal story from today, um, the National Enquirer or, or whoever you know, the, the spokesperson was uh, in, in speaking to the Wall Street Journal explained that that story never came out because they couldn't find enough credibility from the source. But the National Enquirer published a story about Hillary Clinton that you referenced called Six uh, Months to, Le to Live, claiming that Hillary Clinton had six months to live. Um, and so for them to call 
to question and, and, and say that there was a uh, problem with credibility, I think is very hard to believe. And this other thing I really want to point out is the larger context of the fact that Donald Trump was only endorsed by two newspapers, um, which is very low for any kind of major uh, candidate for uh, president. And that was one, the National Enquirer, and the other one was the KKK's uh, newspaper. So that really tells you everything that you need to know about the president of the United States, right? One of the newspapers is a uh, newspaper promoting white supremacy, and the other one is a newspaper that is now becoming clear with the reporting that's coming out today and the reporting that many reporters have been working on um, that he basically controlled, which confirms his theory about fake news and fake media. The National Enquirer, in a way, is fake news because a lot of the stories were being fed by Donald Trump himself or being fed by Michael Cohen. So, Michael, where does this go next? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, ge gentlemen like Mr. Pecker and others with AMI, I mean, it, you know, look, these are not hardened criminals, Ari. So if they have any potential exposure, they're going to be doing everything in their power to hit the exits. Um, and what I mean by that is they're going to cooperate fully, I would expect. They're going to provide any and all information about Mr. Cohen and Mr. Trump um, in a very expeditious ma manner. You know, these are not hardened criminals. These are not the kind of guys that are going to go do uh, five to 10 or 15 years for you. These are white collar guys. I mean, they have lives. I feel, they're like, used to I feel like you're saying basically they're not from the neighborhood. Well, I mean, it depends what neighborhood we're talking about. But look, these guys are white collar guys. They're used to a very nice standard of living. I mean, they're not going to go down and they're not going to go down for Michael Cohen and Mr. Trump. I mean, you thought Michael Cohen was going to flip to the extent that these guys have any information. They're going to be singing like some of the largest canaries you've ever seen in your lifetime. Dan Goldman, uh, as, as someone who used to do these kind of investigations briefly, you're you're handicapping a Mr. Avenatti's analysis on those witnesses. Well, they're going to cooperate. I think the interesting thing is the First Amendment issues. It's, it, there's a, there are hurdles that you must clear in order to subpoena a news organization. And I don't know exactly what they're categorizing AMI, but by subpoenaing them, they've clearly done that. AMI indicated that they're going to uh, claim some First Amendment privileges to protect their sources. That's a potential area for litigation. So they will do everything they can to fight this through litigation. But they're... I agree with Michael. These are people who are not going to want to mess with the government, and uh, it, it, they're going to they're going to try to to cooperate. The interesting thing that you know you pointed out with, with Michael earlier is what Michael Cohen does, and the more we keep hearing him talk about doing what's best for his family, um, as we've talked about before, the more it's likely that he's going to cooperate. And I think the critical thing for him right now is to try to figure out what charges the government right now has against him because by all accounts for someone who has been in some shady businesses for decades there may be a lot more criminal activity that he has to plead guilty to that the government doesn't know about that's part of the cooperation process and he may be doing a calculus as to how much more he has to give up in order to cooperate it's a, it's a fascinating case, and uh, we don't always build an entire legal exploration off a Tom Arnold photo. Uh, I, I, I have to say that as a you know caveat. But the photo is not about Tom Arnold. It's about Michael Cohen's state of mind and the pressure building on him as all of this stuff comes out, which is fascinating. Uh, as mentioned, some of that began with uh, Mr. Avenatti's uh, civil litigation, some of it coming from the feds. Uh, so my thanks to Michael, Dan, and Liz uh, for joining us on the story tonight. Thanks, Ari. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.